Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for tuning in or watching us on YouTube as this is recorded. As always, I'm very grateful for the work of our team. Um, I think Dr. Galandiak is running a little bit late, but she'll be tuning in in a couple of minutes. Last month, we had such a stimulating journal club in Houston that we've decided to come back. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, this month, we're hosted by a world-renowned colorectal department at MD Anderson. Um, an interesting fact about Houston is that the greater Houston is the most ethnically diverse metropolitan area in the United States with more than 145 languages being spoken by the city residents, apparently. And this is even before we start analyzing the way you guys speak English. Um, so I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, this is our disclaimer. Um, next slide, please. And so this is the Department of Colorectal Surgery and MD Anderson. And um, I'd be grateful to, um, to pass this to Dr. Bendarski to uh, introduce the city and the faculty um, and the center. Yeah, no, thanks, Vlad. Appreciate it. We're really excited to, to be here to take part in this journal club um, and, uh, and excited to be, uh, to be a host for this. So um, I just want to quickly introduce um, ourselves uh, as, uh, as the Department of Colon and Rectal Surgery here at, at MD Anderson. Uh, we currently have 10 faculty members and, and we're a department strictly focused essentially on uh, colon and rectal cancer. And, uh, and its treatment and management. Um, as, as noted here, we do everything from uh, robotics to uh, lateral pelvic lymph nodes and then uh, more extended surgeries as well. I wanna make a brief plug for our advanced colon and rectal surgical oncology fellowship. Um, and we, we have one to two fellows per year, provides kind of a high volume operative experience for folks that are interested and also research opportunities. Uh, next slide. Uh, just a quick quick update on Houston. Vlad plugged it well. I didn't even have to put it on there that uh, it is the considered the most diverse uh, city in metropolitan area in the U.S. It's also the fourth fourth largest city in the U.S. and the greater Houston area has about seven million people. And I want to highlight the Texas Medical Center, which um, is uh, pictured below here um, on the lower part of the slide. Uh, it looks like a city in and of itself, and uh, it's home to the world's largest children's hospital as well as the world's largest uh, cancer hospital. There are roughly 9,200 hospital beds in the Texas Medical Center, and it employs over 100,000 people. The city is also known for its food. Um, I don't know if people watch uh, Top Chef, but uh, Top Chef in the U.S. anyway, um, and uh, was recently hosted here. And I'll put the Houston Astros up there because they're the only sports team locally that's doing any good recently. But uh, next slide. Um, I, I have a lot of people on here, and so um, uh, as, as was commented on, but uh, we have a big, a big faculty group, and I just want to highlight, I'll introduce the folks uh, that are going to be uh, discussing the papers. We have uh, Neil uh, Butiani, who's going to, is one of our complex general surgical oncology fellows, who's going to present uh, one of the papers, uh, and then Montserrat Grade Trieba, who is um, one of our uh, advanced colorectal surgical oncology fellows who's going to present one of the other papers, uh, myself. Um, and then uh, I'll introduce Dr. Tran Cao, who is one of our HPB surgeons, who's going to help uh, in, in the discussion today. And then Dr. Upal is also one of our faculties uh, um, with some expertise in uh, peritoneal uh, involvement of colorectal cancer. And then Dr. Newhook, who as well is one of our um, uh, HPV faculty in the Department of Surgical Oncology here, and we'll also be assisting with the discussions. And then the rest of the faculty, uh, again, we have, a, we have a, lots of panelists for people to participate, but um, I won't run through everyone. Uh, and, and then I think we can get started. Next slide. Fantastic. Thank you for that. So um, before we start with the first paper, we've got a poll out, um, which we'll discuss in the end. Um, so if um, everyone can, can pick uh, what they think is most appropriate, thank you. Um, next slide, please. So whilst we're doing that, um, this is our first paper, um, uh, roll off primary tumor location in patients with colorectal liver metastases, a comparison of right-sided colon, left-sided colon and rectum. This paper comes from Tokyo, Japan with Dr. Uh, Takai Niwara being the first author. Um, and uh, uh, thank you very much for Dr. Uh, Butiani uh, for presenting the paper. And then we have Dr. Bendarski and Dr. Tran Kao 
to being the moderating faculty. Uh, so please start when you're ready. Thank you. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, so this paper highlights the fact that previously data has demonstrated differences in outcomes between patients who have liver metastases in the setting of right and left-sided colon cancer, but the left-sided group often is including the rectum. So rectum and left-sided colon cancer are not separated out. And no study up until this point had really assessed whether outcomes differed among patients with liver metastases who had left-sided colon cancer versus those who had rectal cancer. So the study sought to assess the impact of primary tumor location on prognosis in patients with colorectal liver metastases when separately assessing right-sided colon cancer, left-sided colon cancer, and rectal cancer. Next slide, please. So <laughs> these, the, the, the authors looked at 505 patients um, with colorectal liver mets who underwent hepatic resection between 2003 and, 2000, or, and 2017. The exclusion criteria are listed here, and this is in figure one of the manuscript. Um, so ultimately they got to 489 patients who underwent hepatic resection in the setting of colorectal liver mets. Uh, they collected clinical pathologic variables that included recurrence data, uh, both in terms of distribution um, and overall survival. They use Kaplan-Meier curves to assess recurrence, free survival, and overall survival, uh, and then multivariable analysis to look at the prognostic value of certain variables on survival. Next slide, please. So this is a little bit of a busy slide compiling uh, the results in figures two through four. Um, figures two and three highlight the Kaplan-Meier curves of relapse-free and overall survival um, with left-sided, right-sided, and rectal cancer um, all in, uh, highlighted separately. And you can see that the Kaplan-Meier curves actually separate quite nicely where left-sided colon cancer uh, behaves distinctly differently from rectal cancer. Um, and right-sided colon cancer and, and rectal cancer actually behave quite similarly. Uh, you can see that in figure two um, and to some extent in figure three, although the overall survival curves separate um, almost in a tripartite fashion. Um, finally, in figure four, you can see the patterns of recurrence uh, and that, again, the distribution um, between right-sided, left-sided colon cancer and rectal cancer are, are different um, with, uh, with most patterns of first recurrence uh, for left-sided colon cancer uh, occurring in the liver, um, whereas in right-sided colon cancer and rectal cancer, um, liver metastases and multi-site metastases are roughly equivalent. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, uh, one of the points that was highlighted is the multivariable analysis presented in this paper. Uh, there were significant differences in both overall survival and relapse-free survival between uh, left-sided colon cancer and rectal cancer with odds ratios and p-values highlighted here, as well as between left-sided and right-sided colon cancer. Next slide. So the authors conclude that rectal cancer is associated with worse outcomes uh, than left-sided colon cancer in patients with liver metastases who undergo hepatic resection, and that these should be considered distinct and separate disease entities. Uh, thank you very much for this succinct summary. Um, maybe we can now turn to the moderating faculty to, to make their comments in terms of what they took out of the paper. Pop, if it's okay, I'm gonna let you start, um, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for inviting me to take part in this uh, journal club. I, I, uh, so, you know, um, I discussed this paper very briefly with Neil and actually um, found that there was a little bit of overlap between the study and something that Neil and I had discussed doing on our own here at the at MD Anderson. So real quick, just kind of giving a little bit of a background, of course, you know, our group published previously the experience on right-sided versus left-sided, although we kind of uh, named it mid-gut versus hindgut uh, embryological uh, origin of the colorectal cancer. And we found that the mid-gut uh, cancer or right-sided colon cancer had worse survival. And so that kind of um, was the background. So, so the fact that we find this difference, con confirming the difference between right-sided versus left-sided cancer Colon cancer certainly makes a lot of sense. Uh, and the fact that the rectal cancer was analyzed separately in this study was the novel aspect of this study, uh, so to speak, for, for patients with colorectal liver metastases. Um, 
I found this study to be very interesting, although uh, I have to acknowledge that there were a lot of differences in the, in the practice pattern between this patient co cohort and how patients would be treated, certainly here at MD Anderson, but I suspect across you know, North America uh, by and large. Uh, for one thing, very, very few patients received any chemotherapy, either in the neoadjuvant setting or in the perioperative setting at all. Uh, I think it's 10% or 11% uh, for, for both of those aspects, which certainly runs very differently from how we practice here. I think most patients uh, certainly in America would get, at, at the very least, would get adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, here at Anderson, we get a lot of neoadjuvant therapy before we tackle the patients from a surgical standpoint for these liver metastases. The other thing that I found also very interesting, and to me, potentially, in, uh, 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 introduces a, a, a confounding element here is how few patients in this Japanese cohort received neoadjuvant chemo radiation at all in addressing the rectal primary tumor, which of course is very different also from how things have been done here historically. Uh, so to me, looking at this study, I felt like there were a lot of elements that that just introduce, you know, um, uh, potential confounders to, to the, the effects of the survival data that we're looking at. Uh, those are the main things that I just kind of want to, to kind of touch upon, and then I'll turn it over to you, Brian, and we can certainly discuss uh, further. Yeah, thanks for that insight. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I, I would agree on, on, on the points you made. I think it is an interesting uh, uh, difference in sort of practice pattern, right, in terms of the management of these patients. Um, and um, but I, I would also sort of um, echo that I think like anecdotally, I would have had a similar sort of impression of these patients, granted, where we, we have not looked at it, like you said, from a rectal versus left-sided. But, but my sense, right, in, in the practice pattern is that those are different animals when we're treating them um, here in terms of their outcomes and their, uh, uh, their recurrence-free and overall survival. So I think it's an interesting study in that regard where they've tried to look at that but like you said, it is it is different in the sense that our practice pattern is very different in terms of the management of these patients with the utilization of uh, of chemotherapy and um, and chemo radiation. I thought the other part that I thought was interesting was um, again in this particular population that they report is the the high number. I mean, again, over half of the patients in this in this study had sort of a solitary liver metastasis, right? As sort of the as the as the metastatic disease burden, which it's just not a practice pattern that we see here either, generally. Um, and, and again, it shows that the, the outcomes are really sort of impressive uh, without any of these other um, uh, adjunctive therapies like chemotherapy or, or radiation with, with really good um, overall survival in that group. So um, I thought those were interesting uh, notes as well. Um, and, uh, and certainly, um, uh, open to questions. I'm curious to hear what uh, what other folks think about uh, about the outcomes in this study and the in the patient population. Neil, you had some interesting insights as well. I'm certainly uh, welcome you to chime in, in in your review of this paper. Sure. So, you know, I talked a little bit with Dr. Bednarski and Dr. Trankow about the manuscript. One of the other things that you know, the authors touch upon it, um, but but don't go into a ton more detail. Um, it has to do with the, the lack of molecular profiling that's available in this data set. Uh, and I think it would be from a, you know, from a, 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 a cognitive standpoint, figuring out, you know, this lays the groundwork for establishing that there's differences between left-sided colon cancer and rectal cancer, but the why, the genetic underpinnings, um, you know, that's not really delved into. You know, the, the data suggests from right-sided versus left-sided that the, the MSI status is higher on the right, uh, the mutational profile is different, you know, chromosomal instability drives mutations in left-sided colon cancer, and so to see what that difference, if there's a difference in left-sided and rectal cancer would be very interesting to start to explain why they behave like different entities. That, that's, an, that's a very interesting point, actually. Um, I, I, I wanted to just jump in here and ask you guys about um, sort of more about the location of the cancer. So the um, article describes right-sided cancers as cecum to transverse, left-sided as splenic flexure to rectosigmoid. Now, 
uh, how do you view the intraperitoneal rectum and what is the algorithm that um, you follow in your unit when you work um, these patients out? Uh, so that's a good question. I think that practice pattern here has certainly changed over uh, the last last several years in terms of defining sort of what you would, as you're describing, the intraperitoneal rectum or what, what we would sort of group as the upper rectum. Um, and classically, you know, um, prior to sort of maybe the last five years or so, um, we treated all of those patients similarly, right, in the group of uh, getting chemo radiation and surgery. Um, uh, however, I would say that over the last several years, right, um, we, we've adopted sort of uh, the more selective use of radiation for some of those patients. So operating on more patients up front um, and then treating with adjuvant chemotherapy as appropriate. Um, and again, I think kind of right around that kind of peritoneal reflection is an easy place to kind of use that um, differentiation. But even for sort of more mid-rectal tumors, we would consider that approach for the earlier stage disease and, and less margin compromise. I, I hope that kind of answers your question a little bit, Vlad. Yeah, thank you. Um, the other thing which, which uh, both yourself and Dr. Trankow mentioned was the uh, difference in the use of neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy. I've picked up on that as well. And my question in relation to that would be specific to colon cancers and neoadjuvant therapy. So um, when do you do that? And, and what um, tools uh, or, or what approaches do you have for the neoadjuvant therapy in colon versus rectum? So, um... Certainly, I think it's it's a it's an interesting question in a different in a different group a little bit. Again, uh, just like they're treated differently as primary tumors, but particularly in the metastatic setting. Um, and uh, um, we have utilized uh, selectively again, kind of the Foxtrot sort of approach um, of using some induction chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemotherapy for uh, locally advanced primary colon tumors. Um, and again, a, a tricky tricky group to identify, I think, and, and I certainly would welcome some input from other members of our of our section um, to, to chime in on this as well. But usually with bulky adenopathy on CT scan, we would consider those questionable T4 tumors provided they're, uh, you know, non-obstructing, those kind of things. We would, we would utilize a neoadjuvant approach uh, in those tumors to try to try to get that benefit. I would say we rarely use radiation in most of those tumors, except for a low-lying sigmoid maybe that's acting kind of more like a rectal tumor with locally advanced uh, features. Um, but uh, uh, certainly welcome some other insight and maybe I'll call on some of our faculty members that okay, if that's okay. Um, Dr. Kanishi, I see you, I see you on there, my friend. Do you wanna, do you wanna chime in on that concept a little bit? And then maybe we can have Hop um, talk a little bit about maybe for the metastatic patients. You mean uh, neoadjuvant for a colon? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So basically, I I have a almost completely similar indication uh, as you mentioned. So T4 disease and the multiple obvious uh, regional lymph node disease, or some you know uh, even without any decent meds, these patients are you know definitely you know uh, I I feel more tempted to give neoadjuvant therapy. But the other you know problem is actually in colon cancer many. Uh, who comes to our institution is actually quite advanced and uh, a kind of obstructed. That makes me uh, another uh, consideration on whether we should or should not use a neoadjuvant. Yeah, that's something that I need to add. Yeah, that's a good point. Hop, do you want to talk a little bit about it from like a metastatic uh, scenario? Yeah. So for the metastatic, basically, I would follow uh, the you know basically uh, you know liver protocol. So all the patients basically uh, undergo neoadjuvant and uh, given the toxicity of chemotherapy uh, to liver, uh, usually we proceed with a liver resection around uh, at, at most like uh, three months, uh, not like a four or five months chemotherapy uh, in order to avoid any, you know, post-operative, uh, you know, complication, especially on, after hepatectomy. And, uh, and uh, actually the colon resection is going to be either, you know, simultaneous or, you know, a separate, depending on the degree of the hepatectomy, especially when the primary tumor in the rect is in the rectum, we usually give further chemotherapy and the separate uh, rectum 
Uh, so I mean the liver first, followed by the primary second. Thanks, Yoshi. That's that's super helpful. Yeah. Hop, do you want to talk a little bit about um, yeah. sort of maybe maybe when if there were scenarios like particularly in this paper that maybe you wouldn't do neoadjuvant? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So I think Yoshi did a great job kind of summarizing the big picture as to how we tend to approach simultaneous presentations of colorectal liver metastases with the primary. Um, uh, for the most part, we do employ uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, right? Because we look at uh, you know metastatic disease, you know, as 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 the you know you, what you see on imaging doesn't necessarily represent all there is, and so we like to to employ a neoadjuvant therapy approach. Um, there are some scenarios whereby we may, in fact, uh, contemplate doing surgery up front. I think those are if let's say you have a single metastasis in a patient who has a primary that's obstructed or symptomatic, it makes a lot of sense to go in and, and tackle both at the same time, potentially. Uh, but otherwise, we really do prefer a new adjuvant chemotherapy approach. When you're talking about colon versus rectum, we do tend to like to do surgery on, it, it, all, it, it all balances out in terms of the risk associated with the, the, the uh, extent of surgery for, the, for me, the metastatic disease and the extent of surgery for the primary, right? So, if you've got two disease in the in the in the liver that can be tackled all at once, you know, in a single setting. So we're not talking about extensive bilobar disease that requires two-stage hepatectomies or otherwise very, very, you know, extensive multiple partial hepatectomies. We do tend to combine that simultaneously with the colon resection if the colon resection is going to be somewhat straightforward. A right hepatectomy will almost always do at the same time as a right hepatectomy, left hepatectomy, or any kind of other hepatectomies. When you're talking about trying to combine a major hepatectomy with like a APR or LAR, or that, that's just not something that tends to go very well in terms of much greater rate of complications and things like that. In fact, Tim Newhook is um, you know, working on a manuscript uh, describing our experience with combined surgery uh, for primary and, 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 and metastatic disease. So we do tend to separate those out. And at MD Anderson, we do like to do a uh, you know uh, reverse approach of tackling the metastatic disease first, the liver disease first, before tackling the primary. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, Vlad, about the sequencing of things and and, and timing of things. Thank you. I, I I was going to focus on the combined surgery for the poll later, but no, it, I think it's very interesting, and certainly my experience has been limited in that I've done a few cases, but I don't really know what the hepatobiliary surgeons, how they think. In fact, one of the questions that I think would be worse asking is, um, you know, what is a functional liver remnant and what do colorectal surgeons need to know about this um, to, to kind of have a, a equal input into the decision making? Sure. So, so when we talk about the future liver remnant, most of the time we're talking about it in the context of somebody who's going to need a major hepatectomy to get rid of all the metastatic disease. So let's say somebody who's got a ton of disease on the right liver or a central tumor in the right liver that requires that you get rid of the entire right liver. The future liver remnant in this scenario is the left liver, right? And maybe the caudate lobe. And so we always want to ensure that that future liver remnant is A, big enough and B, healthy enough to carry out the job that the body needs it to do. So it's standardized to the patient's body weight and body surface area, in fact. And so in general, we want that number, that standardized future liver remnant to be at least 20% of the patient's body weight if they were completely healthy, had a completely normal liver. Now, for the most part, like Siyoshi mentioned earlier, you do give these patients new adjuvant chemotherapy, and we do know that oxaliplatin and irinotecan in particular are hepatotoxic. And so for those folks, we do tend to limit the amount of chemotherapy we give before we intervene on the liver, but we tend to want to get, get at least 30% future liver remnant standardized to their body surface area. And so if it is large enough, then we can proceed with surgery without the need to do anything else. If it's not, then there are measures that we can employ to get that future liver remnant to grow. Now, how does that impact the colorectal surgeon? Well, that's the thing. So if your future liver remnant is plenty big, 
you're going to be much less concerned about combining maybe two big operations because you know that that liver has plenty of reserve to deal with potential complications, right? But if you're kind of borderline future liver remnant or a future liver remnant that you, you think needs to be nurtured really well, right, during the postoperative period, you're going to want to refrain from doing anything where you're going to put the patient at high risk for complications. So, you know, as the liver heals and grows, it does consume a lot of energy. Might there be some effect of that on the healing potential of the primary resection and anastomosis? Those are the kind of questions we got to ask ourselves. Thank you. Um, th th that's very helpful. Um, a shameless plug about the um, these recordings is that we, we usually clip answers and then share them on Twitter. So I think that would be a fantastic one to, to share. Um, uh, Dr. Kanishi, I think um, you, you've got your hand up. Um, yeah, I, I, thank you. Actually, I have one, one comment, you know, uh, from, you know, former Japanese surgeon. So I, you know, there were some comment on the different, you know, strategy for the, you know, liver meds and the rectal cancer, and that is true. So first of all, uh, this center, uh, you know, uh, the author uh, of this center, uh, the, the center of these authors is the largest cancer center, which is a natural cancer center. Uh, and actually they have like more than 1000 cases of colorectal per year. It's a really huge center with a very good HBB team. And the, their surgery is generally very aggressive with a very good outcomes, as you see in the paper. And uh, given the fact that there's no good randomized trial that showed, you know, obvious overall survival benefit by giving the neoadjuvant therapy in the liver med. Uh, as, as you know, you know, I think the, as far as I understand, the benefit of neoadjuvant therapy in the liver med is a, a, a prolongation of the disease-free interval. And uh, uh, there's no good data on the overall survival, I think. So uh, given on this condition, the many Japanese institutions actually uh, just you know, do surgery without any neoadjuvant, even at now, if the liver limits are limited, like uh, through one or two or three, up to three metastases. So that's why majority of the patient actually did not receive a neoadjuvant therapy in this setting. And uh, talking about the neoadjuvant radiotherapy for rectal cancer, uh, uh, you know, given the data that there's no overall survival benefit uh, by giving neoadjuvant uh, chemoradiotherapy uh, in rectal cancer, I think, you know, giving neoadjuvant therapy or not for rectal cancer, especially radiotherapy, would not matter on likely the, you know, disease-free interval as an outcome in this liver med setting. So I think still, uh, you know, this, you know, the result of this paper that showed the worst left column, uh, worst outcome in the, you know, uh, rectal, rectal cancer would be still applicable uh, likely in the uh, Western country, in my opinion. Yeah, not sure though. Yeah, yeah no, I, uh, Vlad, if it's okay, I'll take, take one yeah, second, but we've got to get on to the other, other paper too. But, um, um, I, I, those are great points, Yoshi. And I don't think any, I, I don't, I don't want, um, it to be considered that we're taking anything away. Again, I think, I think accentuating their outcomes here is actually, is, is, is worth noting, as you said, right? I mean, they have really good outcomes, right? And, um, and I think just noting more the, the change in practice pattern that we have is kind of uh, the point of that discussion right across the, across the pond, so to speak. Um, and uh, Nancy, if, if you're on, I think I saw you on there, Nancy Yu is uh, another one of our members of our department who has looked a little bit at the outcomes for our rectal cancer patients. Nancy, do you want to, are, are you able to chime in? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think just along with what everyone has talked about, different institutions, I think, have distinct practice patterns. And we've just been taking a very aggressive approach, I think, to the resectable stage four population. Um, and I think, you know, I, as always, it comes down to selection of patients and, and choice. So in rectal, sequence of treatment components is, is super important. And we've been somewhat selective. We're able to be somewhat selective in terms of which primary tumor needs to get radiation. Um, but ultimately, I think we looked at our series, um, I think it was about 200 patients um, of 
rectal primary re with resectable liver meds. And actually the five-year survival in the more recent couple years is actually approaching about 60%. Um, so I think at least these results justify a fairly judicious, you know, aggressive, but then judicious approach to these patients. Uh, thank you. I, I might actually um, use this opportunity to ask a question that Dr. Graham Sellers sent me via email. Um, I think he's on the line, actually. But the question he sent was the following. I have a patient with two lesions in the left liver and a low rectal cancer at the level of the anal rectum. He is motivated to avoid a colostomy. Um, if PCR of uh, rectal cancer post um, uh, TNT, um, is it appropriate to watch and wait the rectal part and surgically treat the liver meds? Um, no better place than MD Anderson to answer that question, I suspect. So, uh, yeah, a fascinating question and, and actually an area of ongoing investigation, I think, um, to try to sort out uh, the success of that approach, right? Um, it, it's a fantastic one, uh, particularly to avoid sort of the, the morbidity associated with low rectal cancer surgery, right, in this population. So uh, a fantastic question. And... Um, uh, uh, I, I will also welcome our team members to chime in here who I think have some, some interest in this particular area on the outcomes of these patients. Neil, do you want to talk a little bit? I see you smirking over there, my friend. So this is something that um, uh, Dr. Yu and Dr. Peacock and I have talked about, uh, and Dr. Kanishi as well. You know, so I, I think a, the Dutch group published their results with watch and wait for rectal cancer, uh, stage four rectal cancer earlier this year, and, and they had positive outcomes. Um, and so I think at least by their preliminary analysis, it, it suggests that that is a viable treatment strategy, again, with very um, very specific patient selection criteria that have been pre-established and things like that in mind. And it's actually something we're actively looking at here uh, with our hepatobiliary group, Dr. Trancal, Dr. Vote, uh, Dr. Zung, and, and Dr. Newhook and, and our colorectal group. So. Uh, stay tuned. We should have something uh, in the next you know, six months or so. Well, I hope the response um, in, in that specific patient is durable. <laughs> so that you can advise a bit later. Okay, thank you for that. Um, look, we've had a fantastic discussion in the, with the first paper, but I think we really should move on to the second. Um, so um, the, our second paper is the role of repeat resections in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, a multi-center retrospective study. It's also from Japan. Um, Dr. Uh, Matsumoto is the first author of this. And uh, Dr. Trueba will be presenting the paper. And we're fortunate to have both Drs. Upal and Newhook uh, being the moderating faculty. So please start when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, so apologies in advance, you'll need to like go uh, advance a little bit. Uh, so approximately 20% of the patients uh, with newly diagnosed colorectal cancer have seen Crohn's metastatic disease. And of this, between 75 to 90% will present with unresectable lesions. Uh, next, please. Uh, as we all know, in patients with liver and lung metastatic disease, current guidelines recommend resection of both the primary colorectal cancer as well as the distance disease with curative intent. And this has been associated with improved long-term survival and cure rates. Uh, next, please. Resections uh, for the recurrence has been performed in patients uh, with metastatic disease involving only their liver or the lungs. However, little is known about the re-resection for the recurrences. Next, please. This is why the aim of this study was to investigate the role of repeat surgical resection in the treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer in a multi-institution retrospective cohort of patients. Next slide, please. Next one. You can keep going until the end of the slide. As we mentioned previously, this is a retrospective review of the Japanese study group for postoperative follow-up of colorectal cancer database. They include patients from January 1997 to December 2007 with synchronous uh, distant metastasis who underwent either simultaneously or sequential stage resection uh, within less than six months after the first uh, stage operation. 
Survival time of patients who underwent surgery was defined from each time point of diagnosis of the disease, either primary or recurrence to the time of death from any cause. Uh, namely, overall survivals one, two, and three, and was each calculated from the date of initial diagnosis of primary disease, date of the first recurrence, or date of the brief recurrence. Next slide, please. Next one. Uh, next one. Uh, they, they had, uh, they included in the analysis 1,073 patients. And as we can see on table two, uh, about 66% had only liver metastasis at the time of diagnosis. Next one. Uh, next one. 78% underwent a synchronous resection. And from the metachronous resection group, a little over 90% had resection of the primary tumor first. Of all those patients, 75% uh, had recurrence after curative resection. Next one. And only 40% were eligible for uh, surgical resection. Of those ones, next one, 65% presented with a second recurrence. Next one. And only 38% underwent a resection. Next one, please. And as we can see in table three of that paper, the great majority of the recurrences and second recurrences presented only in one organ, being the liver, the most common one. Next one, please. These are the couple of major cures for a five-year overall survival. As we can see on the top left on the screen, figure 2A, uh, we can see the five-year overall survival after the initial diagnosis and was stratified by metastatic organ undergoing curative resection we can see that it was 54% for liver only and 45% for lung only and 33% for peritoneal seeding and 24 for patients with uh, multiple organ metastases. On the uh, on figure 2B, which is on the top right of the, of the screen, we can see the overall survival after repeat resection. And this was 56 for liver, 43 for lung and 30% for, for peritoneal seeding. Uh, after the first repeat resection, the re recurrence tended to occur in the same organ as the site of the initial recurrence. And as we can see on the bottom uh, figure of the table, the five-year overall survival after the second repeat resection was 56% for the liver and 46% and for lung, with a median follow-up of three years. Uh, peritoneal C and a multiple site metastasis were not representative in this, uh, this follow-up, given the small sample size. And... Um, in all groups, obviously, the overall survival after resection was significantly better when compared to a no resection. Next one, please. As a conclusion, uh, curative resection for resectable metastatic colorectal cancer is associated with improved long-term survival and cure. However, most of the patients will develop recurrence. According to the findings from this uh, retrospective analysis, repeat surgery could have long-term survival benefits in patients with metastatic colorectal cancer who develop liver only or long only recurrences and re recurrences following curative resection. However, careful consideration is needed before embarking on repeat surgery in patients with peritoneal metastasis only or multiple organ recurrences. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, it, it, when there's so many panel members, it's very hard to keep it short because, um, because there's so many valid opinions. Uh, but if it's possible now to have Dr. Upo and, and you hook to, to uh, give us their comments on this. Yeah, sure. Um, Amini, you want to go first? Want me to go? Don't want to be rude. <laughs> no, you can go first. Great, thanks. Well, thank you, obviously, as well to Dr. Bernarski and the panel and the journal for the opportunity to be a part of this and, and highlight some of what we do here and talk about these excellent papers. Um, so just in terms of full disclosure, I'm a liver surgeon and um, end up having to talk about resecting recurrences a lot. And so this was an excellent paper in, from my standpoint that highlights the natural history of the disease that our patients that we see quite frequently will end up experiencing. And I think that this, a paper such as this that has a large number of patients with long follow-up from a multi-institutional setting um, really allows us to have this information to give to our patients. So I wanted to, to mention up front one of the biggest things that I took away from this paper um, was the importance of preparing our patients for this very outcome, um, number one. Number two, to, um, to inform them that recurrence is likely to happen, 
but it is still salvageable. So yes, despair if there's recurrence, but don't despair that it cannot be acted on, acted on given the large number of patients in the study that were able to undergo re-resection. And even after that, another re-resection. So um, some takeaways from me um, were the number of recurrences. Um, this is one of the higher uh, reported uh, in, this, in the literature that I found of, of upwards of 80% of patients did suffer recurrence after initial resection, but it's impactful to know that uh, re-intervention still can afford a large number of patients, over half, um, a chance at five-year survival. Um, I wanted to, to mention that the time period of this study is very critical. Um, now ending, I believe, in 2007. So um, it's interesting to think about what a, a repeat analysis uh, of this would entail. And there is some of those going on at this point in time from our institution that are currently under consideration for publication. And what I mean by that are uh, more refinements in the use of systemic chemotherapy, both as we was Definitely talked about a lot in the last paper, the use of neoadjuvant or preoperative chemotherapy to aid with selection and disease control. But maybe more important than that is the widespread use of um, somatic mutational profiling to help with prognostication for patients. So I bring that up to mention that this predated a lot of our somatic mutational profiling um, that we use these days. Um, and to discuss some of the papers that have, have we've recently published from our group, um, from Dr. Vote and our, and our colleagues that have highlighted the impact of som somatic mutational profiling. I'll say one of our first papers on re-resection of recurrence in the liver is actually in one of the highest risk groups of patients. In 2019, by Dr. Lilimo, Heather Lilimo and Dr. Vote published our experience of re-resection in the liver for patients who initially had to undergo a two-stage hepatectomy. So that's patients with an extremely high liver tumor burden. And um, uh, a, a large number of patients were, um, were able to undergo re-resection. And those patients who were able to undergo re-resection in the liver after two-stage hepatectomy were, had a median overall survival of 140 months compared to 49 months for those who did not undergo resection. So that highlights the, uh, the survival that can be uh, achieved even in high-risk groups um, for those who are able to undergo resection, number one, but also highlights the importance of having our patients seen by hepatobiliary specialists who may be able to consider them for resection. Out of that paper came an uh, important finding that the RAS mutation status was significantly associated with the ability to undergo re-resection and with survival. And to take that to the next level, in the most recent publication from our group, um, consider patients who underwent concurrent hepatectomy along with complete resection of extrahepatic disease and found that one of the most important and impactful independent predictor of survival for those patients beyond sight of extrahepatic disease was harboring a RAS and TP53 co-mutation. So the ability to, to know these, this information about our tumors aids another quiver uh, as an arrow in our quiver to help us with decision-making when applying this. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to bring up to the group um, as well was to actually consider whether or not it needs to be resection, right? So obviously, this patients in this group underwent resection, but it'd be interesting to know how many people underwent alternative local therapies that where resection may not have been appropriate, and what opportunities uh, other patients um, could have who are candidates for resection in terms of long-term survival. So thank you for the opportunity to offer my comments. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, all for letting me uh, discuss this paper. Um, I appreciate, you know, Tim and I uh, work together a lot on uh, understanding what is the interplay between uh, mutational profiling and uh, resection of metastatic colorectal cancer. Uh, you know, he focuses more on the liver uh, space and I work on the uh, peritoneal space. Um, and I agree that there's a there is a lot that needs to be identified um, in that regard, and that would any future studies like this um, coming from a large group of centers will be highly dependent on that on the patient profiling. Uh, one thing I wanted to note um, when we talk about the nature of this, this disease and kind of natural history is in Figure Three, uh, where you see patients who had a liver only or um, uh, metastasis, their recurrence or re-recurrence, if you will, is um, frequently in the liver. Whereas if you look at lung or peritoneal, 
or multiple, you see that so the pi shape or pi distribution is a lot more uh, evenly dispersed. So I think that shows that, as it probably been highlighted early on by liver surgeons, there's something unique about the biology in the liver versus other sites um, that's worth exploring. And that's something that we're looking at now. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out that it was interesting is so in for peritoneal seeding, and the reason this is important is because uh, in, in Japan, the our the concept of side reduction as we do in the U.S. and Europe is a little bit different. So when they see patients who have peritoneal seeding, that very localized peritoneal spread um, that could essentially be resected, uh, and to some extent with the primary tumor. Um, and that's a different paradigm than we think of where we say, okay, if they're peritoneal disease, then they're uh, metastatic stage M1C. And is a uh, is something to consider because as uh, Dr. Kanishi pointed out, uh, surgeons in Japan have a lot of experience with uh, resection for metastatic disease. So the I think that's part of the explanation why the peritoneal uh, group does surprisingly well for patients who essentially are treated with this resection alone, plus or minus adjuvant therapy. Uh, and the last part I wanted to, uh, to note is that um, when doing these types of studies, it's very important that they account for patients who do not undergo surgery. And I think it would be interesting to see what the survival of those patients are at least overall survival. Um, and part of that is spurred by, right now our group has been looking at patients with perineal disease and who are not surgical candidates and their mean overall survival is much longer than has been historically reported. So that it goes with, uh, you know, what Dr. Newhook and others have said that um, the, the, we always think the patients who can't undergo surgery basically are go undergoing palliative treatment. And in some extent, that's true, but in other ways, it's true both for surgical resection and for chemotherapy. And so there's a lot of uh, exciting things that are coming down the pike, especially for colorectal cancer, that I think will significantly change um, our understanding of what is and isn't uh, resectable in terms of the risks and benefits of the patient long term. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for those answers. Just when I thought I've got my understanding of the algorithms, all this new stuff is coming out. So I'm not sure how happy I am with that. But um, to Dr. Newhook's point, um, uh, I guess the resection of metastatic liver lesions is clearly an evolution. What is the current absolute and relative contraindications for liver resections in, in patients with colorectal meds? Um, just a broad understanding uh, for maybe junior trainees would be helpful, I think, of this. Yeah. Um, so as you can imagine, there's a lot widespread things that can that you can't control. Obviously, number one is patient condition, particularly for the junior trainees to pay attention to try not to just focus on the cancer. Right. Our job in general as surgeons, because very clearly from this paper, a lot of people, we are cytoreducing patients. If they're recurring, those things were out there the whole time. So we are trying to judge whether we can help them with surgery better than chemotherapy alone, right? And so hurting, that, hurting somebody who has medical comorbidities that precludes them for an operation or an operation that might preclude them from receiving adjuvant chemotherapy, for example, think twice about that. Um, but in terms of relative absolute you know, cancer-specific uh, reasons for uh, not undergoing a liver section. Clearly, the number number one is going to be the amount of liver remnant left over. As Dr. Trankow eloquently discussed, the future liver remnant is critical, and that highlights the the almost absolute need to have liver volumetry measure, measured prior to uh, major hepatectomy. Number one, number two is liver function. So somebody with portal hypertension. Um, and there are some ins and outs of this, but in general, um, portal hypertension is a, a relative, uh, almost an absolute contraindication for, for at least moderate to major hepatectomies for cancer, because again, we're trying to help them better than chemotherapy alone. Um, some biologic risk factors, as I said, a RAS TP and TP3 commutation may help you decide when somebody is medically or biologically uh, borderline, whether or not to, to offer resection or not. 
um, and then progressive disease. So there are some ins and outs of that as well. But in general, someone who is undergoing preoperative chemotherapy and has progressive disease, a high CEA despite chemotherapy, um, clearly is somebody who's at risk for very early recurrence and obviate the potential benefit you get from hepatectomy for these patients. So I wrote down a couple little bullet points of things that are important to me when I was reading this paper um, when looking at somebody who has had recurrence and evaluating them for surgery. Um, obviously, pre they're preparing patients up front is critical, but location and distribution of disease, as highlighted in this paper, is important. So is it liver only, lung only, liver and lung, or uh, a systemic failure, so to speak? I would consider that unsalvageable for most patients. Time to recurrence is important, although we have a manuscript in preparation right now that will discuss that a little bit more eloquently, so look out for that. Um, response to chemotherapy. So I'm a humongous fan of preoperative chemotherapy because it gives me a window into morphologic response to the tumor and biomarker changes, as we discussed. And again, as I said, mutational analysis. And typically these pieces put together a puzzle picture um, that can allow you to decide who you can help more than chemotherapy alone. Um, thank you. One last question. Um, th there's, a, um, there's a study that we um, shared about using PET MRIs. Um, uh, and that study specifically this month didn't describe um, a, a, be a significant benefit for systemic surveillance. In fact, um, the uh, lung meds, I think, were harder to detect. But, but when you're talking about demonstrating the behavior of the tumor by giving neoadjuvant therapy, um, uh, what in MD Anderson do you do? Is there anything different out there radiologically um, uh, that you're playing with in terms of uh, identifying the bad responders and the good responders? Um, not as of not as of yet in terms of things like PET scan and, and metabolic response. Um, as of right now, that hasn't hasn't improved our ability for stratification compared to our, our typical imaging workup and. Um, measures of response. So as I said, we're, we're very, we very much uh, think about and report what's called the morphologic response, which has three levels. And that has to do with the more cystic type changes you see with preoperative chemotherapy. And that along with, with mutational profiling, I, th I don't think is going to be necessarily outperformed by something like PET scan. Um, but there are, there are some prospective um, studies going on right now. I do believe by my my uh, colleague, Dr. Chun, in terms of radiomics. But as Dr. Bednarski just put in the chat, the most important part is high quality imaging at, right off the bat. So when reading a lot of studies, I, I'm sometimes very, very suspect of the high quality imaging you have up front. And then somebody says, we have so many people who recur within three to four months in their study. Um, was it there the whole time because we had poor quality imaging, right? So thank okay. you. Question. Uh, that, that, I think that's that's fantastic. Um, uh, we're just going to report the poll next, um, uh, Stephen. Uh, if you can do that, please. Yeah. So briefly, the uh, the vast majority, or the not vast, sixty two percent were in preferentially would have addressed the liver first, which uh, certainly lets them take the the early blame for any issues. And then uh, there's you know some people that found that if MIS was feasible, that you could um, certainly bend that rule. And then colorectal component address first is 14%. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I grapple with um, rectal cancer in that I feel I have a lot better visualization to do an MIS dissection, not transection, but dissection. And if then a, a liver resection is also required in an open manner, I do find it difficult to kind of uh, marry the two. Um, in terms, do you do the whole case open or do you do the liver open and then, and then what, what happens next? I think that's, that's a good point, um, especially when you're dealing with low rectal tumors. Uh, you know, the overall studies have shown open versus MIS. There's not, in the expert hands, there's probably not a huge amount of difference. But I think you know, when you're talking about length of case, uh, blood loss, all those things matter quite a bit. And as uh, Dr. Newhook has, has found out, those are kind of the main factors that drive whether or not patients can have significant complications afterwards. Um, so that's why in a lot of cases, if a patient needs, for example, an open hepatectomy, usually if they need an open hepatectomy in a major cancer center, it usually means that they have, it's a major hepatectomy. 
And so all those things together suggest that we're splitting up the operation. It's very yeah. good. Fantastic. Well, I, yeah, so I would say for, for cases where we plan simultaneous resections, right? That's, that's what you allude, I guess that's what the poll question was alluding to, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you know, fortunately at our institution and I'm sure at a lot of others, you know, there is the option to do both combined, like robotically or MIS. So uh, for instance, Dr. Chang and I and Dr. Benarski and I combine and quite a few like combined MIS hepatectomy and Dr. Newhook, MIS hepatectomy and, and colorectal resections at the same time. Uh, this, in my, my bias, and I think <laughs> the poll reflects this, uh, is we tackle the liver first for a few reasons. Number one is fluid management, right? So when we do liver resections, it's important to run the patient dry to minimize blood loss. So the lower the CVP, the better it is in terms of safety of the hepatectomy and minimizing blood loss. So, so that's a big reason why we tend to go after the liver first. The one caveat to that is the instance where your patient may have a symptomatic primary uh, in which case, a lot of the times we'll, we'll, we'll you know, have the primary be addressed first, such that uh, in the event that things don't go smoothly or whatever reason, you know, you can always decide to not proceed with the liver resection, but you've addressed the acute symptomatic issue. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, uh, liver first uh, is our preferred approach. Uh, thank you very much. That, that's a very succinct and useful answer. Um, I might take this opportunity to move to our next um, uh, component, which is the special guest segment. Um, our special guest is, of course, uh, Dr. Joyce Chang. Um, he is the chair and professor of colon rectal surgery at the University of Texas, MD Anderson. Um, he did his clinical training in San Francisco and then uh, became board certified uh, following a colorectal fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in uh, 04. And I understand subsequent to that, uh, really flourished as both a clinician and academic at MD Anderson. Um, Dr. Chang has more than 200 peer-reviewed publications and, and, and an incredibly long list of achievements um, and is, of course, on numerous editorial boards. Um, so I'm very grateful for him uh, sharing his time with us. And I was going to start um, with asking a few questions. Um, now, the first question I have is, um, during my training in the US, I found that there was a surgical oncology pathway as opposed to the colorectal or hepatobiliary pathway. Um, and it seems particularly in MD Anderson, there's a lot of crossover, which, which seems different to um, my experience in Australia. Um, so what is the difference between a colorectal surgeon and a surgical oncologist, if any? Great. Well, thanks, thanks, uh, Vlad, Vladimir, for the invitation to be here, and um, it's it's a great opportunity for our group to participate. So, thanks for that um, as well. And it was really nice to see both uh, Neil Butani, one of our complex general surgical oncology fellows, and Monsi uh, Tureba uh, Gurayev Tureba, who's one of our advanced colon and rectal surgical oncology fellows, um, presenting as well. So, um, I think at the end of the day, um, your your background or pathway to be, to becoming a student of colon or rectal cancer um, really is 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 um, secondary to um, to what we do on a day to day basis. And so I would say the training paths are are a bit different. Um, one um, with respect to colon or rectal surgery is more broad based for colorectal disease. Cancer is a component of it. It's a relatively in the U.S. short training pathway at only one year. Um, the surgical oncology pathway um, is broad-based with respect to cancer management and multidisciplinary care, um, and colorectal cancer is one component of that. Um, I think that, um, so whether, and as you can see from our group, we have people who have come through multiple pathways, and in the case of Abhini Upal is an example, he's done two fellowships, one in surgical oncology, one in colorectal surgery, and we have Ollie Peacock who's done three. Uh, subspecialty in colorectal in the UK, and then um, colorectal surgical oncology in Melbourne at Peter Mac, and then another fellowship with us before, prior to joining us. So um, I think it's a, it's really, it's at the end of the day, it's about, um, it's about our uh, focus on the disease. Um, it's less about, you know, what your um, training background is per se, 
uh, um, and it's really about um, you know uh, being a student of cancer and really trying to forward. I will say that um, whether whether the training is in surgical oncology or in colorectal surgery, um, I think there's a lot more learning that still has to be done. You know, what we do here is, I would say, you know, I, I was, the foundation for that was certainly laid during my training experiences, but mu mu much of what we do here was, were, were things that, that, um, that were not part of a, of my, and are not part of a traditional colon rectal surgical oncology experience. And I would say may not be part of a traditional surgical oncology uh, um, experience either. So, that's one of the reasons we created, you know, our fellowship, um, which is advanced training beyond, but um, to really kind of set set people up, you know, to succeed in in colon and rectal cancer management. Um, so, I guess what I would say is, you know, um, uh, maybe de-emphasize a little bit, um, sort of the specific background, and emphasize um, the attention that we we um, pay you know, to our patients and the disease. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm, the next logical question would be, I mean, you've mentioned the training that you offer, which, which sounds fantastic. Um, at what stage of training would trainees benefit the most from being exposed to, you know, um, the complexity uh, of a specialized center such as yourself, your, your own? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, and we actually have Webb Monsi, who's coming through now, and, um, you know, Dr. Peacock, who came through, and maybe they can comment as well. But, you know, um, I do think that that it we, we, we have an opportunity to learn at every stage of our training, right, uh, from management of complex care. And so we have residents that come through, we have our CGSO fellows as well. And so there are opportunities for learning, for sure. Um, I think that, you know, um, in speaking personally, once um, speaking personally, I would say that you know once you you've identified your sort of um, interest, I think our level of learning changes. We see things differently. We investigate things at a different level. We um, consider things. We're prepared now. It's it's really having that foundational background that allows us to really be prepared to think more critically and really address the complex issues. So I. I would say optimally, it's um, after some training beyond general surgery residency. In other words, you know, some additional sort of at, at least for for the kinds of disease that we we often see here. I think people have the opportunity to get the most out of it if they've kind of gone beyond that first level of you know I finished my residency and I'm I'm looking to do some additional subspecialty training to get through that first. Um, really set someone up to I think gain the most. Having said that, you know, there are opportunities to gain at every step of the way. Uh, thank you. Um, the next question I have is um, uh, about surgical subspecialization. Um, clearly, uh, there's a lot of benefit in, in um, reproducibility and a high volume center. Um, but I have never sort of trained in a cancer specialized center. And I wonder what happens to patients with um, kind of dual pathologies. For instance, if you have a patient with colorectal cancer on the background of IBD. Um, so how are these patients managed in a, in a cancer center? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately um, we have to think about what is, the, what is the driving, what is the disease that's driving the patient's condition? And if we were to talk about cancer and ulcerative colitis as an example, in that situation, it's it's the cancer that's really driving it. And often, unfortunately, as many of you I know, I'm sure have experienced, we're dealing with a new, we're dealing with particularly um, um, we're not dealing with run-of-the-mill colon cancer in that setting. Sure, we can pick up that very early cancer in a patient who's had good surveillance. Um, what we often see are those patients who um, have developed pretty advanced disease. Signet ring pathology occurs very commonly in that setting, as an example. Um, the other group I would say are the Crohn's patients as well, if we're specifically talking about IBD, but we could actually talk about any other disease. So if the, um, you know, our general, we we want to ensure that we, we can provide comprehensive care for sure. But if a patient has advanced heart failure and they have a run-of-the-mill um, colon cancer, let's say, 
that isn't really going to be their rate limiting issue, that it's their advanced heart failure. That's a patient who probably is best served in an academic heart failure unit um, where, where there are uh, colorectal specialists uh, managing that patient. So if we were to take, we, we have actually gastroenterologists who have specific interest in, in um, immunology of, of the colon and who have, in fact, one of our gastroenterologists was a gastroenterologist previously at the Cleveland Clinic, where you're very familiar, where there is a large IBD practice, obviously. So we do have that ability, but, um, and, and it's important for us to engage them. So we really do emphasize multidisciplinary care. Having said that, you know, if a patient has very complex inflammatory bowel disease issues and a early cancer, probably best to be where their um, advanced inflammatory bowel disease expert is. That, thank you very much for that. I'm um, just changing the, um, the question somewhat or, or the direction somewhat. Um, so sometimes or well, often I'm quite cautious when I interpret optimistic results in patients with operative interventions following local recurrent disease, whether it's in the liver or in the pelvis. Um, and I find that it's hard to filter sort of local persistence due to maybe limited operative techniques versus um, sort of during index surgery versus the adverse tumor biology and the aggressive early recurrence. Um, uh, do you find that patients that have had their index surgery done in a high volume center, such as MD Anderson, do as well with sort of recurrent and salvage surgery um, or do you think that some of the publications that we read when we quote optimistic results are actually overinflated? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I might just step back for just one second, though, if it's okay. You know, there's all additional types of subspecialization. You did bring up the concept of IBD, but I, you know, I think it's worthwhile just to think about there's exenerative surgery within the field of even cancer, there is subspecialization. So I do think that, um, it's an opportunity for us to, and you talk about high volume centers, it's an opportunity for us to actually put our best foot forward in the management of patients is really try to uh, put them in the, the most expert hands. You are absolutely right with respect to the issues of, you know, is salvage surgery for recurrent disease simply completing the original operation? And I think there was probably a lot more of that um, decades ago. And uh, today there is a lot uh, more widespread dissemination of TME techniques and people are better at it. And I, we're doing better central surgery. I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing that lateral pelvic failure is a, is a much more common location for pelvic failure than central failure in many centers today. And that's because, um, and in many situations, that's because when central surgery is good, now it's a biologic failure. So uh, one, of, um, one of our fellows uh, who's now on staff here, he's one of our on staff, unfortunately, as a gastric and pancreas surgeon rather than as a colon and rectal surgeon, but um, published a paper with us um, where we looked at outcomes of our patients who had multidisciplinary treatment for rectal cancer and surgery by us. And we looked at survival outcomes, much like the paper you saw from the Japanese, actually from Kanemitsu's group uh, at the National Cancer Center, really looking at um, the different sites of, of disease. And we showed that um, salvage surgery for liver metastasis, they do, they do great. Uh, they do great partly because I think those patients probably have proximal rectal disease, as an example, and um, have more favorable biology. Lung resection also does well. When we looked at those patients who underwent salvage surgery for locally recurrent disease after we had operated on them, we identified that we didn't really improve survival. Now, local recurrence is a major problem, right? In terms of local uh, disease burden, there is nothing more visible than a, uh, than a pelvic recurrence that's uncontrolled. And so there are a lot of benefits and I think we really need to be thinking about quality of life as well. Um, and of course, any comparison, when we look at salvage surgery versus no salvage surgery, we're comparing different groups of patients. But I think it's quite notable to recognize that what you say is exactly true. It is much, much more difficult to salvage patients who recur uh, after good um, initial index operation, because a lot of times it's a biologic failure rather than a technical one. Technical ones are very salvageable, uh, but biologic ones obviously are more difficult. And we need to be smarter uh, about how we manage, uh, how we think about the disease. We need to really take into consideration the molecular markers, as well as how we target them with the novel therapies. It's not simply a technical exercise. Of course, we have to be able to outline 
a resectable tumor, obviously. And certainly that boundary continues to move. Uh, um, what we used to think were limits of resection, we really don't, there aren't always such limits today. The, um, and, and, and it gets back to the earlier comment that I made is, it's not just, it's not just about um, looking at overall survival as the outcome. We want to ensure disease control such that their pelvic disease um, is, is, not, is not the cause of you know, uh, what really can be a miserable um, existence. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, thank, uh, I'm very grateful for the entire team from MD Anderson, specifically, of course, Dr. Chang and Dr. Bednarski uh, for um, sort of supporting the Journal Club. Um, and uh, I've had a wonderful time and I've learned quite a bit. Um, I have to talk to the hepatobiliary surgeons with a little bit more um, patience and respect now. Um, <laughs> but, but no, I, I think it's been a fantastic journal club. So thank you all very much. Um, next month, we, are, um, uh, we have another session in the University of Chicago. And then in November, uh, we're working on a debate, a Con OS debate, which is going to be a new feature. And hopefully, um, hopefully we'll have some fireworks with quite a few passionate people on both sides of that. Okay, so thank you all again um, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks so much. This was really great.